Good morning, you guys. It's your boy Ben Mahari here, representing Mahari Nation Sports Podcast. Much love to the entire LDBC and the basketball community. If you guys want more basketball, tune into Basketball Conversations every Friday night, 9 p.m. Central Time. This is where we discuss basketball-related topics, news, debates, and everything else in the world of basketball. If you're new to the channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon to get all the latest notifications when I start dropping videos and live streams. And please spread the word about the channel, too. So, with all that out the way, let's get down to business, shall we? So, this is not, this is another historical perspective video, but this one's going to do it a little bit more differently because I was listening to a video uh, yesterday, and this video was particularly talking about, and also salute to Two Raw for TV for that video too. And he, this was particularly talking about the issues between Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Will Chamberlain. Okay, now. I initially did not know that those two had, you know, bad history with each other. You know, I always expected that those two were kind of respected to each other. And to the most part, they were. But there were a lot of things about them that I didn't particularly know about until uh, yesterday. Um, I didn't. There were a lot of different details about their, uh, dis, their dislike for each other that really has not hit the fan a lot as much as it should. Now, let's begin by this, okay? Um, I was watching an, uh, an interview back in 1997 when NBC was announcing the 50 greatest players uh, of all time during the, the 50th anniversary of the National Basketball Association. And Ahmad Rashad, who was working for NBC Sports, was interviewing uh, Will Chamberlain and Bill Russell. This was two years before uh, Bill Russell tragically died in 99. And when they were interviewing Ahmad specifically asked both of them to name their top five greatest players of all time. And they were jokingly saying about six, but we're going off of their top five. Now, what Wilt said were his top five greatest players of all time were, were basically were basically in inverse order. But he had Larry Bird, Jerry West, Oscar Robertson, Elgin Baylor, and Michael Jordan as his top five greatest players of all time. Bill Russell had Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Elgin Baylor, and Bob Pettit. Now, when I looked at the, the comments about the vid, about that interview, there were a lot of there were a lot of young people that were basically saying like, "Well, hey, what about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Well, why is he not on the list? Y'all hating on Kareem, on Kareem. Y'all hating on this dude." I'm like, "You guys need to settle down and really think about this from their perspective, okay?" Those two players played against each other in the 60s, all right? A lot. And so Kareem didn't even play in the NBA until the 70s, until he was drafted. As soon as as uh, Bill Russell retired from the NBA in 1969, it was the same year that Kareem was entering into the NBA. And so Russell had no history facing against uh, Kareem, all right? While for Will Chamberlain, he continued on during the early 70s and had – you know, competitions against Kareem. They met each other once in the playoffs and back in 1972 during the Western Conference Finals when the Bucks were, were in the West. And so this was the Laker team that won 30, had the NBA record 33 straight victories en route to their championship. And so they had, you know, good battles over the years, but they were basically friendly and respected of one another. And what I learned was is that uh, when Kareem was growing up in New York, as he was, you know, entering into the world of basketball, Will Chamberlain was pretty much a mentor of his. You know, they they basically respected with each other. They were friendly with one another. And Will, you know, gave him clothes, gave him anything that he needed to help to help support the man. And Kareem was very respected of that. As he was getting into college when he was going to UCLA and understanding the role of being the athlete, being a tall, superior athlete, you know, Wilt was able to relate to some of the struggles that Kareem was going through during that time. And it was very friendly. They were very respectable for one another. And they pretty much had great respect for one another. But it wasn't until Wilt retired from the NBA where the relationship began to sour, you know, very, very deeply. And Wilt never stopped, you know, criticizing Kareem on various things. And what Wilt particularly criticized them on was he basically he basically criticized Kareem for not making his teens better. You know what I'm saying? 
that he he, he took criticism on Kareem for being you know lack being you know lack of aggress well, showing a lack of aggressiveness. He didn't play enough defense. He didn't score enough or even rebound enough. And when Kareem you know, basically broke Will Chamberlain's all-time scoring record when he passed him on the all-time scoring list in April 5th of 1984. They shook hands and very were cordial for one another, but the tone in that relationship was very, very, very different because Will took chances to bash Kareem on all different fronts. When it was in, in interviews or live television broadcasts, you name it, he never stopped attacking you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at every front. Now, the one thing that he particularly criticized him on mostly was his lack of rebounding. Now, when Kareem began in the NBA during the 69-70 season, okay, he began that time, w was among the top leaders of rebounding. He averaged 15.3 rebounds per game during the six seasons in Milwaukee. And in the 76 season, in 1975-76, uh, Kareem nearly had 17 rebounds per game, which is basically rounds up to 16.9, and that was during his during his uh, final season, you know, with you know with the uh, the Milwaukee Bucks. I should say, never mind. I should say during his first season with the Lakers. I should say my mistake, because uh, Chamberlain, I mean, uh, Kareem was traded to the uh, L.A. Lakers by that period of time. So my little mistake on that, but. It was. It wasn't until later on, and in, in during his mid thirties to early forties, where you know Kareem rebounds were starting to dip from thirteen point three and seventy seven all the way down to at least seven rebounds per game during the eighties. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, and I know among one of them that Lakers were pretty much a very fast paced type of team, in which. Kareem knew how to preserve his energy and knew how to knew how to utilize his skills in different areas because he didn't have to worry about, you know, banging on the boards, you know, every game and pretty much trying to sacrifice his body a lot, you know, getting rebounds. Because you had, you know, Magic Johnson, who was a six foot nine point guard who's a very above average rebounder. You also had AC Green, you had Michael Thompson, you also had um uh, Kurt Ramis, who contributed to the rebounding. You had James Worthy, who contributed to the rebounding. I mean, you had different guys on the team that could pretty much rebound by committee, and therefore Kareem didn't have to worry too much about, you know, particularly rebounding or banging both boards because he had guys that they could basically do that for him. And particularly, Kareem was more focused about scoring and pretty much being a defensive presence. So I don't particularly agree with Will Chamberlain's assessment on that. But there is one particular thing that I think has a lot to do why Kareem didn't really have the same kind of respect for Will Chamberlain later on, you know, as the decades went on. And I firmly believe on this. I believe that Will Chamberlain's perspective on politics really ha had a very negative effect on Kareem. And that's why I think Kareem doesn't hold will to the high respect as some people do and it has a lot to do with you know will's perspective on politics because will during that time in the 60s now keep this in mind keep this in mind as we're going to talk about this because we're talking about a totally different time that we are dealing with as of right now during the 60s which was during the height of the civil rights uh era um will chamberlain voted for conservative he voted for republican and during the uh, the nixon administration um will chamberlain was reported on interviews publicly endorsing um richard nixon and later on in the 80s and perhaps somewhat in the early 90s um chamberlain also endorsed ronald reagan and george hw bush which rubbed a lot of people off the wrong way because be a black conservative during the 60s especially during the height of the civil rights era, not a good, not a good combination and not a popular, not in a popular position for people, for a lot of black athletes to take. While Kareem was more vocal of the issues of civil rights and equality, equality for black people, he was very much outgoing and outspoken and Kareem vo generally voted for Democrat. And I won't, I won't pounce 
on Kareem on that one because during that time, you have to understand, Democrats were pretty much in favor for civil rights and everything else else involving that. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into that, but I would, I'm just telling you that Kareem never said that publicly, but I believe in his heart of hearts, that's where a lot of the disdain and a lot of the, ph the philosophical differences came from. And over time, Kareem got so fed up and got so sick and tired of Wilt Chamberlain's, you know, criticisms that Kareem pretty much, pretty much knew what was to what was going on here. And so those two guys really did not get along as much as they should. And it's kind of sad because they really had really good respect for one another and they respected each other's games. In fact, there's even a lot of times where a lot of people don't even put Kareem nor Will Chamberlain in their top 10 greatest players of all time, which is absolutely absurd. Now, for Chamberlain, I could understand uh, to probably a certain extent because as gifted as Will Chamberlain was as a seven-foot center and as athletically superior, superiorly dominant as he was, he did not win enough and did not show up in the big moments. You can go all the way back when he was in Kansas especially after that triple overtime classic in the 1957 title game against North Carolina, uh, Will Chamberlain, through the stuff that I kind of read, was lash lashing towards the officiating of that game and pretty much threw his team under the bus and threw his teammates under the bus. And by his junior year, um, it was said to behold that he got sick and tired of the constant double and triple teams that it, nearly that it basically drove him out of college basketball. This is one of the reasons why he spent, you know, a few years with the Harlem Crow Trials before he, before going into the NBA. Now, Kareem had it a little bit different in a certain extent, but has some of his own, you know, difficulties. Because remember, when he when he was in college too, they M M college players as freshmen were not allowed to play on junior varsity teams. And during his career, the NCAA basically banned the dunk shot because of the dominance of Kareem. And still was averaging 25 and a half points per game and averaging near 30, 15 rebounds a game during his during his four years, including three national championships and three more outstanding player awards and three and a three time All American. So everybody knew how dominant these guys were. But it's just I find it asinine how those two guys are not mentioned in the top ten or even somewhat in the top five. With Chamberlain, I could get, but with Kareem, I don't get. Because what Kareem was able to do throughout his entire career, a 19-time All-Star, okay, six-time Most Valuable Player Award, six-time NBA champion, all right, 10 times he was on the first-team All-NBA, all right, he was also on NBA, he was also a first-team All-League defender five times during his career, and he's the all-time leading scorer in NBA history. So I don't understand why they don't even why many fans don't put him in the top 10 or even in the top five with the media i kind of get because his political views back in the day were not well received by many by some in the media so i i kind of expected that from the media per se but in terms of you know with the fans you know most fans know what time it is but then there's a majority of fans that don't know much about their basketball and just neglect what kareem was able to were able to do throughout the, in the basketball court and what he was able to achieve in his career I know I was going off a little bit of tangent there, but I just wanted to, you know, get to that, to that particular thing to throw us up some context. But let's continue on the subject. So, by the time uh, Kareem retired after the eighty-eight, eighty-nine season, he went to work writing his own book, and in that book, he specifically put a section of the book. Basically, writing down, writing an open letter to Will Chamberlain, and basically he called him Will. Chamberlain. <laughs> I just found that, you know, kind of funny. But there was basically a, a section of the letter, but I had to find, you know, the early beginnings of, of that chapter. So thankfully, I was able to find an old archives of uh, LA Times article that basically said in word of word in detail what Kareem said about Wilt during that specific chapter in his in his book. So I'm going to read to you what he said in that book he wrote in 1990. So here goes. End quote. Will and I go back. When I was in high school, there were, there were two men I could be like, Will or Bill Russell. I kept a scrapbook of photos of both of them in action. Will lived in New York then, and I sought, his, I sought out his company. I'd run down the block 
just to say hello. But as I grew older, I strongly disagree with some of the positions he took, like supporting Richard Nixon for president and degenerating black women in his autobiography. And it's worth mentioning, too, that Will Chamberlain, on a side note, didn't was not as involved with civil rights as much as he should. So there's a little bit of context on that. All right. So we'll continue. But I never really disliked, disliked Will. I've always respected him professionally and for what he achieved. He is one of the best centers to ever play the game. I've decided to take the opportunity to respond to all the aspirations he's cast on me over the years. And this is the part where he writes down an over letter to Wilt Chamberlain. So here's the letter that he wrote in 1990. It's been several years now, Wilt, that you have been criticizing my career with your friends in the press. Since this matter does not seem to have any end in sight, I feel that I might as, I might as well well, have to say, have, I might as well have my say about the situation. It would have seemed that someone who achieved as much as you did would be satisfied with his career. After all, some of the things that you that you did during your time were quite admirable, and given us an enduring set of records for the books. So why all the jealousy and envy? In trying to figure this out, I started to look for for what would you be jealous of, and then that's when the picture started to become clear. Many remember how frustrated you were when your team couldn't win the NCAA tournament. Your talents and abilities were so great that everyone assumed that the NCAA was all yours. But after a ter terrific overtime game, Kansas lost. You complained about the officiating, your teammates, and other things, and then you quit. Leaving college early to tour with the Globetrotters. That seemed to, to set a pattern for you. After any tough test in which you didn't do well, you blamed those around you and quit. In professional basketball, Bill Russell and the Boston Celtics gave you an, a yearly lesson in real competitive, in real competitive competence and teamwork. All you could say was that your teammates stunk and that you did that you d had done all that you could. And besides, the Reds never gave you a break. Poor Wilt. In 1967, your team finally broke through. That 16 established records that are still standing today. But in but in the following year, the Sixers lost, and predictable as ever, you quit. You came out of L.A. and got with a dream team. The only, the only lack that team had was a leadership at the center position. Bill and the Celtics took one from you in 69, and the Knicks followed their suit in 1970. People are still trying to figure out where you disappeared and disappeared to in that series. True to form, after the Knicks beat the Lakers in the World Championship in 1973, you quit and haven't been seen on the court since. Of course, you came out every so often to take a cheat shot at me. During the sixth game of the World Championship Series in 1988, you stated Korean should have retired five years ago. I can see now why you said it. If I had quit at the time you suggested, it would have been right after the disappointing loss of the 76ers. And it would have been, one of, it would have been typical of one of your retreats. But after that loss, I decided I had, I had more to give. I believed in myself and the Lakers stuck with it. We went down. We went. We went on to win three out of four world championships between '85 and '88. The two teams that you played with that had won that won world championships in '67 and in '72 never repeated. They never showed the consistency that the that the Lakers of the '80s have shown, and you didn't want to be a part of that. Given your jealousy, I can understand. So now that I have one, now I have now that I have left one thing, now that I have left. One thing will be part of my legacy. People will remember that I worked hard with my teammates and helped us win. You'll be remembered as a whining crybaby and a quitter, stats and all. Woo, man! I'll tell you what, though. I mean, you got to give Will, you got to give uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar a lot of credit for being articulate in some of the things he was talking about. You know, because a lot of the stuff there is kind of true. Now there were some circumstances where you know. That Wilt's teams just didn't really get it done in the big in the biggest of moments, especially during 1969. About 69, see, that's a tough one because Wilt injured his knee during the fourth quarter and wanted to get back into the game. And Butch Brent Brudikoff, who didn't really did not like uh, Wilt Chamberlain, did not want to put him back into the game and basically told Wilt Chamberlain, "We we don't need you. We're better off without you." And so. I felt that the 69 thing was kind of a little bit unnecessary, but, you know, you could understand where Kareem is coming from in all of this. 
because Kareem was basically basically putting Will Chamberlain in, in his place and pretty much breaking down why Will Chamberlain had so much envy and jealousy over over Kareem's career. Now, when you look at who the players that should probably be look up to, I do agree with two raw on this. It's not Michael Jordan. It's not Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, or Kareem. Some of it is on is basically on Will Chamberlain. Now, when in terms of the political views, everybody knows what time it is. I don't need to put it into other words about what about two about both of their perspectives. But I find it kind of ironic how you know Will Chamberlain can criticize him on this about his lack of aggressiveness, but but still was a was a two time rebounding champion. Kareem was. And I find that very ironic that you could say that he doesn't do enough scoring, even though he's the all-time leading scorer in NBA history. So I don't particularly understand it. I don't get it. And at the end of the day, you know, Kareem pretty much will put Will Chamberlain in his place on that on that book. So, but although I think those two were able to look, you know, reconcile a bit before Will Chamberlain died. So they don't. I don't think Kareem has that much hatred against Will Chamberlain, but there are some historical stuff out there that kind of, you know, defeats the purpose. And I will say that Will Chamberlain, you know, unfortunately was not as vocal as he should have been, unlike what Kareem was back in the day. So I can understand from people's perspective when they think of Will Chamberlain in a different light. You know what I mean? If they want to call him a sellout, that's pretty much on them. But I found that very, very interesting. And so, I'm going to leave you guys in the comment section. Do you guys agree what Kareem was saying, or do you guys understand what Wilt was saying? But I'm going to leave you guys in the comment section. I'm going to go check y'all out. Peace.